Hey, you guys. So the title of this video is slightly hyperbolic. Obviously, most corporations and companies are not just like a bunch of evil geniuses sitting around like double, double, toil and trouble, like trying to figure out how to cheat you out of money. But there are tons of ways that companies do kind of get you to spend money maybe when you're not realizing it or maybe in ways that don't really benefit you. And we're gonna talk about a few of those ways today. I would love to do a part two of this because I'm only really talking about three main ways, but there are tons and tons more. You guys know one of my main messages here on my channel is that it is up to us to do our due diligence, do our research, and make sure that the dollars that we are spending or anything that we're spending, whether it's our energy, our time, or our money, is being spent exactly the way we want to and exactly for the reasons that we think we are spending them. If you are new here, my name is Whitney. My channel is all about beauty budgets, consumerism, getting the most out of our existing collections, unpacking messages from the beauty industry, and figuring out what, if anything, we can learn from them. If you're not new, hey, what's up, pageant mom and him. So don't forget to check out my Patreon and the War Paint Facebook group in the links down below. So don't forget that the War Paint podcast goes live everywhere in November. I will announce the date very, very soon. So let's just get started already. So I got this information from a combination of articles, looking up information about sales psychology. I found some TED Talks. Like, this is from a myriad of different places. This isn't relative only to the beauty community. This is done in all facets of sales. But basically, the main thing you have to keep in mind is that the way that companies get you to spend money is to keep you in a state of reacting. There's a lot of emotions that are being played on. There's a lot of a sense of urgency that is being used. So the main thing I can tell you guys, if you take nothing else away from this video, is don't impulse buy. That is a big, big thing that companies rely on for their sales figures to reach what they need them to reach. So like I said, take all the stuff under advisement, but at the end of the day, if you do nothing else, just think before you buy. So let's talk about the number one thing that companies use to get your money and that is sales. And what you need to do in order to kind of combat the urge to spend stupid money is to understand the point of a sale, kind of what the goal actually is. I've said it many times, companies are not out here just doing things out of the kindness of their heart. It is absolutely a quid pro quo and they're usually the ones benefiting the most from that type of a relationship. There are hundreds if not thousands of videos that go up on YouTube every year that are completely dedicated to sales. The three biggest ones or the ones that I see the most content around tend to be the Sephora VIB sales, the Ulta 21 Days of Beauty sale, and the Nordstrom Anniversary sale. I don't even have any kind of notifications from these companies. They ain't in my email inbox. I'm not perusing their social media. And I know every time those sales are going on because they are literally everywhere on my YouTube feed. Everywhere I look, people are talking about what they're buying for the sale, what they wanna buy for the sale, what they're saving up from for the sale, showing their haul from the sale. We have entire content strategies built around sales and that's kind of wild. So. Obviously, if you can save money on any given item, that's the best situation to be in, but you have to understand that the goal of a sale at the end of the day is to at least get you in the door on the app or on the website of the company or brand that is having that sale. It's an easy way to get you there. There are probably very tough people out there who can see a sale, walk in, log on, and get only and exactly the one thing that they're there to get, but that's not the majority of us. In fact, you are probably going to stock up during a sale because, hey, it's cheaper, so what possibly could go wrong here, right? I feel like the Sephora sale kind of has this down to a friggin' art form. Depending on your level or your rewards tier with Sephora, if you're a VIB, you get 15%. And if you're a VIB Rouge, you get 20% off of your entire purchase at Sephora during the VIB Rouge events. Sephora is definitely having more sales than it ever has before. But the thing with Sephora and why I think people gravitate towards this sale so much is because Sephora doesn't really have sales. Yes, I know. Sephora does have a on sale section in every store and they also have an on sale page at the website. But listen, ain't nobody checking for any of the stuff that is on sale at Sephora. I'm gonna do a video reacting to what's on sale at Sephora, 
but I'm not being hyperbolic when I say nobody wants it. That's why it's there. If you look at what's over there, it's shades or collections that either did not do very well or they're collections that have long since run their course and the company has to sell this stock so that they can at least make back what they invested into the production of those items. Like Fenty's holiday collection from last year is on sale at Sephora. And that's just nuts to me because, I mean, don't that mean that stuff's like pretty close to expiring? I don't know, just food for thought. <laughs> so when Sephora says 20% off your entire order, anything you want, that shit is music to most of our ears. Ulta does send out a 20% coupon um, on some of the mailers they send out, but if you read the fine print, there's usually a big list of categories of products or brands that you cannot use at 20% off on. But here's the deal, and I've said this before, while 20% isn't nothing, it just flat out is not enough to justify going on a shopping binge. I can tell you that in the days of yore before I went on this no buy, it was not unheard of for me to drop three, four, five hundred dollars at the Sephora VIB Rouge sale every time it came around. And when I actually looked at what I got for the amount of money that I spent, usually equated to around 80 bucks, which isn't nothing once again, but there's about 320 other dollars that have been spent in the pursuit of saving 80. And the crazy thing about it is, once you get into that mindset of like 20% off of an entire purchase, it encourages you to spend more and check price tags less. And that's a big part of why companies tend to promote a sale off of percentages as opposed to a dollar amount because they know you probably won't check the actual price tag of what you're buying. It's been proven. This also has a lot to do with how sales are framed. Usually when you get a notification for a sale, it's what? A Labor Day sale, a Memorial Day sale, an anniversary sale. They design them to immediately make it clear to you that this is for a limited time only. Once again, going back to what I said at the top of the video, they want you to react. They're trying to give you a stimulus and your reaction is supposed to be to buy. I mean, it works, right? Because Labor Day is happening now. So I have to get this stuff now or never. Overall, I don't think sales are the way to go. I mean, if you know, like you know, like you know, you can control yourself, spend a reasonable amount of money that you would already be spending, whether this item was on sale or not, go for it. But like I said, as the hundreds of thousands of sale related content on YouTube suggests, I don't think that's the way we're playing it, but to each their own. Number two, companies will try to highlight benefits, not features. And why is this relevant, especially in the beauty community and in the beauty industry? Well, I'll tell you. Beauty marketing is all about emphasizing benefits from the word jump. It is how it's done. I've said this before, it's why gorgeous 20 year olds are seen and used in ads for anti-aging cream. It's a big part of why in the UK, they have extremely strict regulations on what cosmetic companies can put out as ads. So in other words, you cannot put a picture of a young girl advertising a anti-aging cream and then Photoshop it because the way the UK looks at it, they're basically gonna be like, no, um, that's unrealistic. Those same results cannot be achieved by a normal person. This is clearly down to the model, the photography and the airbrushing. They flat out will not let you advertise that way, which is bananas that we do it in America. Do you guys know for years, I don't really watch a lot of ads anymore on TV. This is where I saw this the most. So I don't know if they're still doing this. You'll have to let me know. But for years I would watch TV and like Maybelline or CoverGirl would have a commercial for their newest mascara. And at the bottom of the screen in the right hand corner in teeny tiny little letters, you could read something that said lash inserts applied. Lash inserts are a fancy word for false lashes. So they were literally advertising mascara with false lashes. Let's talk about how any given beauty product is marketed towards us and to us in the form of a YouTube video. You're not hearing things like, I don't know, Tarte Shape Tape has a doe foot applicator aerodynamically designed to fit precisely into the hollows of your under eye. Tarte Shape Tape is made out of holographic unicorn queefs harvested at the time of peak queefness. Tarte Shape Tape has a handle that's meant to be more comfortable in your hand, blah, blah, blah. That's not what you're being told or what's being emphasized to you because once again, they're gonna highlight the benefits, not the features of any given product. You hear things like, 
Oh, it's gonna make your skin so flawless. Oh my gosh, it doesn't crease at all. Those are the benefits of owning this product over another one. But it doesn't just end there. While we might be able to clearly articulate the benefits of Tarte Shape Tape over any other concealer, that only halfway emphasizes the benefits of owning concealer at all. The goal is to get you to equate having brighter, smoother, more flawless under eyes with vastly improving your life. Most of us know there is probably zero problems that a concealer could actually solve in your life outside of maybe helping you look better in a selfie. But that's why beauty marketing can be so insidious, intentionally or not the imagery that's used to sell, the people that they align their brands and their products with. Hell, even the influencers that they're using are typically ones that are considered aspirational or flawless or might have some sort of like otherworldly quality about them. These are not always messages that we are consciously aware of or consciously aware that are influencing our decisions around buying any one thing over another. I mean, it's not like you're gonna sit around and watch Jennifer Aniston on an Aveeno commercial and be like, I really wanna bang Brad Pitt, so I need to buy whatever she's hawking right now. Like, it's not quite that black and white. Most of us aren't looking at Kylie Jenner and thinking, I wanna be a 22 year old billionaire, so I better get lip injections. But you are kind of being sold on the idea that it can't hurt. Those things, lip injections, flawless under eyes, long lashes, whatever the case may be, um, inspire an idea in you that once you possess them, you will become more desirable, more beautiful, more worthy than if you don't have them. How much proof of concept do you need that a waist trainer can help you get 450,000 subscribers or followers on Instagram than to pay attention to the fact that they're being sold to you by people who have 450,000 followers on Instagram? This is a tale as old as time. This is not new. I'm gonna read this directly from my phone because I found this interesting. Back in the Victorian era, the syphilis outbreak sparked a surge in wig making. Victims hid their baldness as well as the bloody sores that scoured their faces with wigs made of horse, goat, or human hair. Although common, wigs were not exactly stylish. They were just a shameful necessity. That changed in 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair. Louis the XIV, I don't know, I can't read Roman numerals, was only 17 when his mop started thinning. Worried that baldness would hurt his reputation, Louis hired 48 wig makers to save his image. Five years later, the King of England, Louis' cousin, Charles II, did the same thing when his hair started to gray. Both men likely had syphilis. Courtiers and other aristocrats immediately copied the two kings. They sported wigs and the style trickled down to the upper middle class and Europe's newest fad was born. So even though these men had to wear wigs out of necessity because they had syphilis, the second someone of a higher class or status had something, even if it was to hide a venereal disease, it trickles down into the people below. And that is exactly what we're seeing happen with social media influencing and advertising in general. It's why brands use actresses, rappers, singers to uh, sport their clothing. I mean, Billie Eilish is hawking Chanel right now. It's because she is admired, revered, and looked up to. In some ways, this is just kind of how we're wired. We're going to probably do what the most famous, most wealthy, and most beloved people amongst us do as if by some form of osmosis, those around us will find a similar value in our little old selves. It rarely actually works out that way. I mean, I got lip filler two years ago. I don't regret anything. It took me two years to make the decision to do it. It ain't bothering nobody. I'm a grown ass woman, I'll do what I want. But the good news is I didn't get lip filler under the impression at all that it was going to change anything about my life. The only thing it's changed is lipstick for me. If anything, I get more shit about my lips now than I did before, but it makes me happy, so I don't care. I guess the point is, when you are being sold on the benefit of a beauty product and to niche it down even further, the benefits of beauty itself, it's important to keep in mind what is actually achievable, who is selling it to you, if there's anything even wrong with you in the first place, and in what ways is it actually 
benefiting your life. Don't end up with a syphilis wig. That's all I'm trying to say. Number three, every single thing about the retail stores you walk into are designed to get your money from the second you open the door. Most retail stores and casinos, fun fact, do not have windows. Ulta is a really good example of this because at least with Sephora, nine times out of 10, it's inside a mall, which probably doesn't have windows in it anyway. But Ulta is found in strip malls. They're standalone stores that are totally massive, that have plenty, plenty of areas to throw a couple windows up, but they don't because the idea is to get you lost in there, lose track of time. The longer they can keep you in there, the more likely they are to get your money. Once again, just like casinos. Ulta is killing it compared to Sephora. The stock is up, sales are up. A lot of retail is struggling, but Ulta somehow is not. Well, it's not somehow. There's tons of reasons why they're thriving. I will be doing a video about that very soon. But one of the ways that Ulta has kind of cornered the market on beauty and why it is doing so well is because they have created a one-stop shop beauty destination. You can buy high end, low end, you can buy hair tools, you can get your brows done, you can get facials, you can get your hair done. Like there's a ton of stuff that you can do in there and never have to go anywhere else to get your beauty needs met. And that is very smart on their part. Once again, what's the goal here? It's to get you to stay longer. I have always suspected that Ulta has a drugstore side of their business to kind of like lure you in for the cheaper stuff, but over time slowly gets you kind of wandering over to the high end side. And alas, that is exactly, exactly what one of the goals is, as I recently found out doing a little research. I'm gonna read this off my phone. I found this quote from an article from back in 2017. One key to convincing more upscale brands to sell their products at Ulta was showing them how customers buy Ulta's mass brands. Ulta executives refer to it as mass migration, with more inexpensive brands acting as a sort of gateway drug to the tempting $50 Urban Decay eyeshadow palettes that sit right across the aisle. According to Ulta statistics, a new customer who starts out buying 100% mass in her first year as an Ulta customer spends about 40% in mass and about 60% in prestige by her fifth year. 77% of Ulta's beauty enthusiasts buy both mass and prestige. Twitter and Instagram were full of posts of women bemoaning the fact that they went into Ulta to pick up one quick thing and ended up spending a hundred dollars. Girl, we all been there and it is not on an accident it is completely by design. Another way that brands set their stores up to get your money are cash wraps. Cash wraps are those little areas at the front near the register where they put typically like the sample sizes and the travels and the minis. A big reason why more and more stores are employing this method is because people are physically coming into stores to shop less and less frequently. And once they get you in the door, they trying to get you to shop. They're trying to get you to spend money. So the many products of the cash wrap probably seem like a really good idea. If for example, you don't want to pay $45 for a primer, but they have a mini for 20. But the thing is the $20 mini is almost always more expensive than the $50 full size. And here's why here in the beauty community, we have gotten really good <laughs> about looking at cost per ounce or cost per, per gram of any given product that we buy. And for example, that's a big reason why people justify Natasha Denona's price points is because there's so much product in there and per gram, you're getting a way better deal, blah, blah, blah. I get all that. And this is where the mini option ends up being far more expensive than the full size will actually cost you per ounce. And this is why you gotta be careful about those cash wraps, man. Like they're literally putting um, more merchandise up to the point of sale to the very last minute that you're in that store, they're still selling to you. So be wary of those guys. Rewards programs. This is something I have seen people struggle with a lot. And by struggle, I mean, I've had many, many situations where you guys will tell me that you're willing to spend $80 to get $30 in reward points reward points. I cannot say that. Or you're willing to spend $200 in Sephora before the year is out so you can maintain your VIB Rouge status so that you can spend more money later when there's another 20% off sale. It's spending money to save money any way you look at it. And Ulta even has a credit card that gives you double points on all of your purchases. This is another quote from another article I found. A rewards program can accelerate the loyalty life cycle, encouraging first or second year customers to behave like a company's most profitable 
10 year customer, but only if it is planned and implemented as part of a larger loyalty management strategy. The goal must be to develop a system through which customers are continually educated about the rewards of loyalty and motivated to earn them. I mean, that has a Sephora VIB sale written all over it, does it not? Be VIB, we have a sale a few times a year. Like, just be aware of those loyalty points. They're great if it's money you would actually spend anyway because who doesn't wanna get something back from spending money on things that they already are gonna use, but don't be racking up points so you can save money later. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense, right? I can't be the only one. So the next thing you need to pay attention to is where items are located on the shelves anywhere you go. This is true at grocery stores. It's also true at Sephora. They tend to put the cheaper products um, on the floor, on the lower shelves, and the more expensive ones tend to be at eye level or higher. And the last thing that stores, particularly makeup stores, have figured out and do exceptionally well um, is tester. And yes, testers are amazing. They help us figure out what products we want to use, we can swatch them, figure out what colors and textures. I'm 100% less likely to buy a product if I can't test it. Honestly, shopping online for makeup is very rare for me because of that. However, it's not just to help us out. Once again, testers encourage you to stay in the store longer. It gets your hands on more things. It gets you to already kind of feel a sense of ownership around that item once you're able to actually touch it, apply it, and see the benefits of it immediately. Who has not walked out of Sephora or Ulta with testing swatches from tips of their toes to the tips of their fingers? I know I have. And as I said, it absolutely kept me in the store much, much longer than had the testers not been available at my disposal. But yeah, these are all things to keep in mind when you go into a store or a casino. It's all designed to get your money. And it's not bad, it's not inherently bad to spend money or go shopping. I certainly don't mean to imply that, but like I said in the beginning of this video, the goal is for us to make sure that we're spending money, time, energy, whatever, on exactly what we think we're spending it on, exactly for the reasons we want to spend it on, and we're getting exactly what we are paying for out of the deal. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I can absolutely do a part two of this if you guys want because there's a lot more of these kind of little sales tricks and things like that that companies are using to get your money, girl. As always, thank you so much to the patrons. I am having so much fun over there with you guys. Please come check it out if you're feeling squirrely. Lots of benefits, lots of fun stuff going on over there. It's just a cool place to hang out with me and get extra content and early access to the War Paint podcast, which is going live everywhere in November. Don't forget to come hang out with us on the War Paint Facebook group. It is Literally my favorite place to hang out on the internet. I'm kind of neglecting the shit out of Instagram because I spend so much time on the Facebook group, but lots of inspiration over there. Lots of fun tips and tricks about how to get the most out of your makeup collection and how to save a little money and still look like a glam bossy ass bitch. Whatever you're trying to do, I'm here for it. So anyway, make sure you check the damn bar for links to all my social media platforms and I will catch you in the next one. Bye.